Well, just to, to give you a bit of an idea, uh, this is a very, very early research. So it's more like a project than a paper. Uh, I'm working with a couple of people from Oslo and uh, from St. Gallen. And what we talk about is these uh, activity platforms or, uh, patterns over time on, on crowdsourcing platforms and how actually they develop over time. So briefly, I'll talk about the, the, the well, I'll skip the introduction of myself and the project in terms of time. So I'll, I'll talk about the framing of the research, why we're doing this, what are sort of questions that come up. Uh, then a bit about the context, some of the data and some early findings. Uh, so it's really very early findings. Um, feel free to sort of ask me questions along the way if you have any clarification questions or anything. So how I look at these kind of platform organizations is that they're all crowd-based. And what that means is that they're dependent on a crowd for uh, to sort of generate sort of value and then these platforms try to appropriate value and roughly I, I kind of distinguish between two types of platforms uh, on, on the left you see sort of the, uh, the, the, the facilitators so they basically facilitate two parties to interact and in exchange things so for example Uber or TripAdvisor are these platforms that do that and then there are more of these platforms that are uh, real intermediaries that basically go stand in between the solvers and the people who seek solutions and they sort of package that and then grab lots of value. And these are more of these, well, what we've talked about, Innocentive, 99designs, but also Kickstarter. And what is interesting about sort of these, these crowd-based platforms is that there's sort of a, a crowd logic here. And what I mean with crowd logic is that these platforms sort of assume that people participate because they, they want to perform tasks and they want to do it because they like doing the tasks or they get something from it. Uh, but basically there's a very functional purpose. So people don't join crowdsourcing platforms because they are looking for community or because they want to be friends and, and discuss these things. This is really sort of a, a work-driven, very functional way of looking at things. And that means that if you, you think about performance of these platforms, that they're basically assumed to be invisible phases in the crowd, which means that it doesn't really matter who you are. The assumption is that anybody from the crowd it will be good at doing some kind of task. And it really kind of it matters whether you have the innate abilities to solve a particular task, whether you're good at it or not. So what this means is that crowdsourcing platforms don't really care who you are. Um, and they assume that if, if the crowd is large enough, then there will automatically be some people who can make contributions to any kind of task. And, and this is sort of the, the way that they work. So they, they try and grab as many people as possible. And then they say, well, we can basically solve any kind of task you want. And as I said, uh, we're, we're, I look at a lot of these sort of area C types of things. So these are very simple tasks. So asking people for suggestions and ideas for new products. And basically, the idea is that, well, it doesn't matter how much experience you, ha uh, you have or, or what you exactly know. If I have 100,000 people, then some people will come up with great ideas or solutions uh, for me as a company, for my clients. So there are two of these implications of this crowd logic. And first of all, this idea that a good contribution can come from basically anybody. So crowdsourcing platforms don't focus on sort of recognizing who, every, who everybody is. And they assume that everybody is sort of after registration, equally likely to contribute a good idea at any point in time. And therefore that a new member is basically as valuable as an existing member that they have. And at the same time, because of this functional approach, they don't really focus a lot on supporting interactions or social elements on these platforms. So it's really about tasks that collect a group of people around them that are interested in them, and then sort of the ideas and the solutions will come. And for us, it led to a, like a main research question. What we're really wondering is, well, does this crowd logic actually make sense? And, and specifically, can you say that everybody is pretty much equally valuable on these platforms? And is that also the case over time? So specifically, what we're, what we're looking at or what we want to look at is do we see big differences between people? Uh, so how is, for example, uh, activity distributed? Uh, do we see big differences of people over time? So is everybody equally likely to contribute at any point in time? Or do we see very kind of clustered uh, activity? And, and what about experience? So does it actually matter that you've been active on a platform for a longer time? Or do these things not really matter? Uh, and finally, 
what, we, what these platforms are about is about coming up with solutions, generating ideas, generating um, uh, solutions for particular problems, but you also have lots of activities around that. So for example, people comment on each other, people rate each other ideas, and, and how does that actually, that, that those behaviors that have a social component, how do they actually influence the, the behavior that the company is interested in, that the platform is interested in, these ideas, and then how well these ideas are developed. So to talk about the context that we have, uh, so we, we have, uh, as, as I said, a, a particular clear area C type of crowdsourcing platform. They ask for uh, ideas to very broad questions. And we have data that's a little over 10 years on all the activity that happened on this platform. So basically, the platform, uh, in collaboration with, with my friends in, uh, in Oslo, they gave us basically everything that has ever happened on the platform. Uh, which means that when we got the data, so mid-August, we basically have more than 95,000 registered members, uh, 450 different challenges that had been, uh, been active. And of course, if we talk about sort of good versus bad things, well, of course, the platform itself might be successful, but some challenges work out really well, while others do not. So you can really see the differences between challenges in terms of participation and, and how successful they are. Um, well, we have loads of data. So 55,000 uh, submitted ideas, almost a million submitted comments, uh, almost two million ID ratings. So lots and lots of data, and all of this data is timestamped, and we know who was the submitter and also who was the receiver, which means that we can actually look at how submitting, but also how receiving comments and, and ratings actually affect people's behaviors. So to give you a bit of an idea of what happens on this platform, and it's mostly about the shape, so it's not really about the numbers, but what you see is the platform starts up, and then it seems to sort of kind of stabilize. So you basically get these straight lines from 2011, well, they go up and down a bit, but it seems to stabilize over time. And what we, the reason why we thought this was interesting, because this is actually what happens in terms of registered members. So in order just to be able to have a sort of a stable contribution of ideas and comments and ratings, the platform has tripled in size in the last five years. And you can imagine that that has to end at some point. So for this platform, and, and, and the idea that platforms focus so much on getting new members, not so much about keeping their old ones, at some point it will be hard to get new members. And then you can imagine that these platforms start breaking down fast. So, so what have we, so what's the idea of the research that we're gonna do? So the, the idea is actually to look at members uh, that registered at a particular point in time and then track their behavior for a, a period of time. And the idea was that we, we look at uh, members who registered in 2009 and 2010, uh, basically because then we have about eight years of data after that, but also because the, early, the, the earliest years you saw the platform really start up. So, so basically by that time, the platform was a bit stable. They, they started getting more challenges and more and more members, uh, and, and we started tracking those over time. And then we looked basically at 250 challenges. So basically five and a half years of data, uh, and we looked at all the challenges that took place in that period, um, and we saw like how much activity did they have on those uh, challenges, uh, and, and how do they develop over time, because these challenges obviously are are uh, sorted by time. Uh, the problem is that then you have sort of an unbalanced panel. So this is a bit technical, just, but just to give you an idea what we, what we actually did. Uh, so basically you have a bunch of members, a bunch of challenges that people are active in, but people register at different points in time, which means that you don't have the same data for everybody. So just to make sure that we wanna have sort of a clean balanced panel set we'll, that we'll do some research on later, we actually said, okay, we're gonna look at the first 160 challenges that somebody could have entered in after registration. And this gives us a sort of a nicely balanced set and, and it also allows us to do some research that haven't been, hasn't been done before and that's actually at looking at, from a member level, how they are active over time within this context. So the final sample that we're working with is, uh, is, is the active members. So just to, there were 15,000 people who registered, 5,000 people never uh, signed in after registration. So these are just, you know, uh, well, I would almost say like stillborn. So these are people who never were planning to be active at all. Then about 5,000 never 
became active and only about 5,000 actually did anything in any point in time. So we look at the challenges that were, what we say, at risk. So the first 160 challenges that people could be active on, and this gives us a balanced panel sort of about 700,000 rows. So it's at least lots of data. Um, and what we're interested in is, okay, so, uh, oh, so let me describe briefly what's in there. So basically there's lots of activity going on. So um, in the end, this group of people submitted 13,000 ideas, almost 150,000 comments, and a little, uh, what is it? 374,000 ratings. So there's lots of activity going on in this, in this data set. Uh, and as you can see, the, the different activities are done by, by often like only one third of the people actually submits an idea. So this is just to give you a bit of an idea. There's lots of stuff going on, um, but, but how to get back to those ideas that we were testing, so that we were interested in. So how, does, how is this activity actually distributed over people? How is it distributed over time? So to start by giving you some descriptors of, of what we've found is this distribution of activity over people. Um, and one of the things that you see, and this is basically for, for all three uh, types of activities, we see that a very, very small group of people, let's say two to three percent, is responsible for most of the activity. Uh, so what we've done here is we mapped out, uh, so, so we mapped out basically the different groups. Um, I think that the resolution is a bit off, but, but basically these are different groups of people. So, uh, how many people have submitted no ideas, how many one, how many at least two to, two to five, and, and larger groups. And basically the takeaway here is basically the shape of this graph, which is that there are very few people who take the lion's share of all the activity, and it's not just for ideas, and, and some people might do comments and some people might do ratings, it's actually that these are the same people. So out of those 15,000 people, I would say that let's say 250 do almost everything that happens from that entire group. Which is, well, you could argue that, well, clearly the platform wants to know who those 250 are and be able to recognize them early on. Uh, so this is one of the first sort of takeaways. Do people use multiple uh, names? Uh, well, I don't know whether they did. Uh, I mean, we could check in some way, but it would be weird in the sense that, um, yeah, their activity is counted, and, and it would be, there's no real benefit for them to do it, let's put it like that. They cross uh, comments uh, each other very positively. Th that could be something, but, but in the end, and the funny thing is that, uh, well, if you have uh, this many ratings, so on average an idea gets about 50 ratings, it, it hardly matters. And another thing, and it's not in this presentation, but we've also already found that ratings are not necessarily linked very closely to who wins. So it gives an idea of what the crowd likes, but the company might actually pick a different uh, thing altogether. Uh, so these are uh, what Andrea was talking about. This is not the sort of pre-selection that a crowd does in order to actually be able to win something. So yeah, so very few people do most of the work. Um, and another thing that we thought was very interesting was, was this. Um, the left one is the most sort of, you can really see the shape, but basically if you plot activity over time, it, now after 10 weeks, most of the activity is done, and the only people who are continuing to be active are those, those 200 something people we already talked about. Uh, again, we, we grouped it a little bit, but clearly you can see that there's a very strong kind of slowdown in activity. So even though a platform might say, oh, I have 100,000 members, then actually a very small set of those will be active, and those who are active will only be active maybe the first 10 weeks after registering, and then they're just done. Uh, so this is, this is a kind of an, an interesting finding as well. And then what we see is that, the, that people become more active over time. And uh, so it seems that over time, the average activity that a person does when they participate, so for example, uh, the average number of uh, comments that somebody uh, places when, they act, uh, when they're active on a challenge goes up from about five to about 15. Uh, here there's two effects going on, of course, so those inactive people might, uh, might drop out. But we also looked at the same group of people over time. We see that people actually become more active over time. So this is also, an, I, I would say, so if they stay active or if they stay uh, members and active members on the platform, they do so in a more active way over time. 
Well, of course, it's also interesting to look at performance, and, and these are just some descriptors to give you an idea of what's in this type of data. Uh, but basically, what we found is that there's a pretty steep increase in average performance over time. So this also means that the ones that stay active, they seem to be learning to become better. Again, this might cover a bit of a selection and a, a learning aspect. So what we did is we actually separated it. And what we tried to do is we tried to separate these different groups of activity and then whether their ratings over time. So if you, for example, look at these, these top two lines, these are the most active members over the course of this data set. They started out being better, but they also became better over time. So there seems to be some kind of selection, but also some kind of learning effect there. Oh, well, it literally, it's the average ID rating that they get for their ideas. Rating. Yeah, yeah. so this is the rating. Yeah. And, and one of the future things that we want to look at is, is actually whether they, they have a higher chance of winning something. But at least the ratings and the ratings they get from others goes up. Uh, and it's quite significant, so, or quite large. I mean, all of these jumps are significant, but basically they go up from about a five to uh, almost a six and a half, which is quite large. And I mean, because of the, data, the size of the data set, we're talking about thousands of, of data points. So these are also quite uh, stable. But a, a last thing that I, we just wanted to check to be able to, to say something useful here is what, if, so what actually leads to people to continue to be active? So what we did is we looked at all the people who have at least one idea. And then we said, OK, what, what kind of predicts or what is related to them submitting another idea? But 41% of people actually submits a second or more ideas after the first one. Um, and this is a very simple, quick and dirty logit model that we did. But what is really interesting here is that the number of comments received is positively related to this, but not so much the average rating received. So getting a lot of comments, though the social behavior that people start to engage in seems to make other people more active uh, and, and doing the things that the platform really wants, ideas. Uh, but it's not so much about how well they performed in terms of the ratings that they received. So it's really about this, this social aspect seems to do something in terms of long-term activity. And a couple of okay, other things, and this also gives a bit of trust to, to this data, is the fact, for example, that if a dura the duration of a contest is longer or if the popularity of the contest is higher, which means more people submit it, then those uh, participants actually are less likely to continue. Uh, and you can argue that this is because uh, people just participated because everybody was doing it, uh, and therefore we would expect such a, an effect. Or the fact that you just simply had more time to participate on a, on a contest also means that yeah, you would expect them to be less prone to, to continue uh, after that. So, these, so all of these things are, uh, are quite in line with what we thought. So, so this is just very quick and dirty, some data, some, some, some things, but it, it gives us some ideas of why it might be interesting to look at these uh, types of things. So just summarizing what I've talked about, seems to be then on these crowdsourcing platforms, it's actually a really small group of people that does stuff. Then they're mostly active in the early weeks. And what is interesting is that over time, they become better and more active. And one way of getting them to become more active is actually to comment more, and, and this, again, engages other people to become more active as well. So what I would say, based on these kind of findings, is that it actually matters to figure out who are the ones that are very productive, who are the ones that are less productive. And this might actually be a very interesting sort of area of research uh, um, to continue with. So there are some really clear results that it does matter, and that some of these kind of assumptions or logics of the crowd are not necessarily uh, completely valid. Well, and then, yeah, this is just some idea. To, to, I worked on these data points uh, last week, so to just give you an idea of what we're doing. But, but of course, there are some steps that we're taking. So obviously, we really need to sort of frame this contribution in, in line with existing theory, and be happy to hear your thoughts on that. Um, we have data on rewards. We have data on contests. So we are really uh, trying to add those elements to it to just make this the story a bit uh, more credible even, and to kind of show it from different sides. Um, and yeah, we, I mean, I showed you some basic uh, descriptive statistics, uh, which look impressive given the size of the data set, but, but basically we have a panel set, so we can actually look at several interesting things, and one would be how, does previous, how do previous experiences drive future activity? Can we identify why people die and when they die? So when they be, 
stop act being active. Uh, because, I mean, now we just assume that everybody is potentially active. But what you see if you look at this data, then lots of people just are active, 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 and then nothing anymore. And it's, it's interesting to, to understand why that happens and when that happens. Um, and then, of course, the, the kind of a broader question that I think also relates to some of these other presentations before is what, what basically drives this ongoing activity? Is it because some people are just prone to be more active anyway or, and better? Or is it because by being active on the platform, they become more active? And I think this really nicely relates to the, the Airbnb study. Is it that people go on the platform because they were already entrepreneurially spirited? Or is it because of the experiences that they had there, they became more so? And what were these experiences that drove them to become more or less uh, entrepreneurial? Uh, so I think that this is a nice data set to test such logics uh, with. And then some ideas that we have is like looking at this from a life cycle value thing. So we, I, I can talk about how many ideas they submitted, how many ratings, how many comments, but how valuable is that for a platform? And, and what should a platform do to motivate certain things? Uh, how much should they invest in, for example, getting a, a social dimension to this platform? Uh, and that's interesting because this is something that the platform did. So after we kind of, the data set that we look at is about 2013, uh, we have the data going forward. Um, and we saw that they started introducing specific rewards. And we were wondering, and this is one of the next questions that we would have, how, does, how do those rewards actually motivate these behaviors? So they have a community reward for collaboration, one for feedback. So when they introduced them, did people actually start doing those things more often? And how did that actually affect people's, other people's or their uh, uh, behavior uh, in terms of submitting ideas and doing sort of these supportive behaviors? And that's uh, it from my side. So I hope that this has inspired you to, for some good questions and comments. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.